Welcome to WebRTC Live. In WebRTC Live, we cover the latest technical topics and business use cases for WebRTC and live video. As always, this episode is brought to you by WebRTC Ventures, leading integrators of WebRTC video into your custom application. Welcome back to WebRTC Live. I'm your host, Aaron Sign, founder and CEO of WebRTC Ventures. WebRTC Ventures is a custom design and development agency focused on building live video applications. We're here to help you take your application live. You can learn more about us at webrtc.ventures. Thanks for joining us today live on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitch. Welcome also to any of you watching a replay of today's event. For those of you with us live, you can ask questions throughout the stream by leaving a comment in whichever platform you're viewing this on. For today's episode, I'm joined by Sandra Gauchi, who will be discussing the WebRTC vulnerabilities and, and the attack surface. Sandra is a founder, CEO, and chief mischief officer at Enable Security, RTC security audit and penetration testing experts, and to the real-time communications community is also known as the original developer of SIP Vicious, the open source security suite for auditing SIP-based VoIP systems. Thanks so much for joining me today, Sandra. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for inviting me here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, enjoyed uh, meeting you at the TAD Summit uh, last year and, and some excellent presentations there. And uh, yeah, I think this is going to be a really interesting conversation for our viewers today. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit more about yourself and the work that you do at Enable Security? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm Sandro Gauci and uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Enable Security. And, um, you know, my team and myself, what we do is um, we help companies with uh, real-time communication security, and we take an offensive approach, as in we help companies do security testing of their real-time communication systems, applications, and so on. Uh, then that involves voice over IP and also WebRTC applications. Um, and we do penetration testing. We have the tools to do that as well, our own tools, Subvicious Pro and other, other things that are coming out, consultancy, all on, all taking an offensive approach rather than a purely defensive approach. The idea is that offense should inform defense. Absolutely. So what, what uh, uh, phases of kind of the life cycle of, of an application development do you typically do that work? Um, well, across across the uh, the whole spectrum, um, quite often we test ready-made products. So quite often it's at the end, but there's a huge shift in security nowadays. Uh, you know, uh, the idea that shift left. It's called uh, the idea to go uh, at the at the start and uh, start doing security testing and start thinking about security from the start, uh, designing with security in mind. Um, and I think there's there's a, a huge advantage there because security gets more and more expensive the later you do it, or the more you ignore it, yeah. <laughs> give it to the end. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in, in WebRTC security, a lot of times, you know, people talk about how our traffic is encrypted and that's what they think about as what WebRTC security means, but there's a lot more to it, uh, as, as you know. And so, yeah, it, let's get, let's go into, you know, uh, what is the attack surface on WebRTC? What are the types of vulnerabilities that you encounter most often? Mm -hmm. I'll... I'll be showing uh, my mind map uh, as, uh, soon. Um, so, yeah, we uh, we came up with a mind map. Um, it, it's the mind map focuses more about on uh, on uh, the infrastructure. So we're not really talking about the client side stuff, the WebRTC uh, framework, and so on, but more about the infrastructure and. There's a lot to think about, right? You can see the mind map from a distance. You can see that it's relatively complex. It's not extremely complex, but it still works in progress. It's definitely not complete. Um, but I find that mind maps like this help us uh, are really great at breaking down complex ideas. And so this is kind of very useful for us to... Um, 
to think about the attack surface of WebRTC infrastructure. Um, so yeah, there's the title there. And what I mean by attack surface uh, is of course, it's kind of, you know, when you're thinking about what vulnerabilities a system has, you're thinking about the attack surface, right? What sort of features are there and what, how can they be attacked? Uh, the more features or the more code you have or the more applications you have, the more you're likely to have a larger attack surface and therefore more things to um, secure, more things to worry about, I suppose. Um, and in the WebRTC uh, infrastructure world, we kind of, in our case at least, we kind of split them down into four different topics, signaling, media, net traversal and gateway. And I will briefly describe them, each of them. So let's start with signaling. What do we include? We include with signaling. Well, you could have um, SIP over WebSocket, or you could have uh, XMPP over WebSocket, or you could have custom protocols. In fact, with, with VoIP, you used to have custom protocols, proprietary uh, protocols from the different vendors, Cisco, Avaya, and so on. They all had that. Um, nowadays, with WebRTC, you also have that because, you know, the standard doesn't, uh, the standards don't really define a signaling protocol as such. So many, many uh, use their own. Um, but the truth is they all have similar features. Especially, you know, you it, across the board, right? You need to start and stop video calls, uh, the media. Uh, that's that's definitely common all throughout, and many other features are also common. So, um, when we think of signaling, that's definitely something very interesting from an attacker's point of view, and I will dive into that a bit later with a demo. Um, and then there's the media. What about the media? Uh, well. There's RTP for audio and video. There's SRTP to encrypt RTP, and there's the TLS. And all of these carry their own attack surface. That's why we kind of split them. Um, and I will not go into detail when it comes to the media attack surface um, here because we don't have hours and hours to, to discuss. But um, as you can see, there is already a, <clears throat> a bit of you know, um, quite a few attacks that we have done. So this this mind map is based on the sort of vulnerabilities that we have tested and we have found during our work. Um, but something that I should mention when it comes to the media is that this is very much works in progress and we're still discovering new vulnerabilities. Um, that affect media in a WebRTC environment. And then there's net traversal. Um, you know, what we're talking about is ICE and uh, STUN and TURN. Um, and I will also be uh, discussing this later on. I will go into one particular vulnerability. And finally, there's the gateway. Um, you know, the thing is that anything that connects your WebRTC application to a different network, maybe you want to make uh, dial out from your conferencing system or vice versa, you want to dial into your confer video conferencing system, well, you need to connect it to PSTN or you need to connect it to your VoIP system. Maybe you have a phone system that you want to connect to your conferencing system. Uh, so, yeah. We're talking about, you know, VoIP, PSTN, or both. Um, and this is kind of not well explored, at least from our end, but I think not many people are exploring this. But um, something to keep in mind, if you're a developer working on this part of the infrastructure, you know, protocol conversion might be problematic when you convert from one, say, let's say, proprietary signaling protocol that you're using in your WebRTC application to say SIP, you might have problems there with when transforming, translating from one protocol to the other. Uh, those vulnerabilities tend to be very specific, 
but that's why the question marks, uh, but very interesting, of course. Um, and message processing, you know, how you process uh, incoming um, messages, uh, incoming signaling. Um, that's also a problem, of course. But uh, yeah, it's very specific to each platform on test. So let's go back to signaling. Um, the attack surface here is quite interesting. Uh, most protocols have well-known vulnerabilities, you know, SIP. We have done a lot of work in, in SIP, and as have other people. Um, and there are vulnerabilities that are specific to SIP. Um, there are vulnerabilities that are specific to XMPP as well, if you're using XMPP for your um, platform. And other protocols will have their own. But in many cases, like I said, the similarities between these protocols mean, means that there will be similar vulnerabilities that affect uh, all of them. Um, I'll be focusing on one particular thing, so one particular item from my list of potential um, kind of, let's call them modules or features that can be attacked, quality of service. Um, and especially, uh, I'll be talking about uh, resource exhaustion. Um, if you, the thing is with, with signaling, if you bring down uh, the servers that process signaling, no one can start and, and stop calls. So, you know, everything is kind of depending on signaling to your, your, uh, your WebRTC platform will depend on that. And so it's quite a major choke point. And, um, you know, one of the things that we find here is that this can be a huge problem. Uh, if you run out of resources on your signaling servers or any of their dependencies, databases, whatever it is, then that's, that's a huge problem. And so we have a demo. And let's put that aside for a bit. And yeah, I should. So we have our demo server, we call it, where we have, it's vulnerable to a lot of security issues, voice over IP and also WebRTC. And we have, I'm gonna start the developer tools so that we can check out what's happening here. And on slash call, there's a bit of a hidden sort of, not so well hidden, but uh, there's a hidden interface there. And of course, you don't want to start a, a, a war, but uh, if you go to perform a call, you can then instead uh, start a call instead. And we can see this is using WebRTC. It's uh, using SIP over WebSocket. And if I call one two zero zero, and then it starts. I, I start hearing myself, so I will stop that. Uh, it sends a, a zip invite, of course, and um, starts the call. Um, what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to attack the underlying server, which is asterisk behind Camellio, by using our attack platform. Let me switch to the to the um, console here. So what I'm going to do here from my, my own computer is um, uh, ping and start pinging the WebSocket server, where which is handling SIP. Um, and kind of monitor, get, get a response every second to monitor what's happening, right? To monitor if, if the system is still up. It's kind of a health check. And on the other side, I'm gonna start what we call our attack uh, platform, which basically um, we have various, we have five servers right now running. 
And once I start this this command, it will basically run the Subvicious Pro tool, uh, DOS flood uh, tool against the WebSocket server from different servers out there at a very slow rate, uh, in my opinion, 400 uh, messages per second each. Okay, so times five. Um, and it's going to attack to call, send an invite to zip extension or the zip address 1200 at demo.zipfishes.pro. So let me start that. Uh, it's kind of ramping up now. Told our our uh, kind of bots or DDoS agents uh, get started, and immediately you start noticing, you know, a timeout detected. Right now, if I go back to um, to here, I clear a bit the screen. Uh, that's where the SIP messages are being sent, and try to call again. And the invite is sent. It might actually reply because the, the speed is not too bad. So it did reply, but it asked us for authentication. We authenticate this time. Our browser does that. And this time it will time out. It takes, takes some time uh, trying to get that working, but then it times out. Now, if I stop the attack, it should recover. And we will see that it will recover over here, eventually. Here, it kind of got a buy. And uh, yeah. This didn't work. So that's that's the sort of uh, you know the sort of attacks that you might see on on signaling, which you know work pretty well. Um, and uh, yeah, if you've never tested your signaling servers for you know denial of service or stress testing, um, then you might be in for a surprise. Now, let me get that back here. So yeah, another favorite target um, this time is the net traversal um, thingy. So uh, it, it turn relay abuse falls under the net traversal umbrella. Uh, it's a vulnerability that seems more like a bug, like a feature than a bug. So that's that's interesting. Um, and we kind of split this into two, two parts, external proxying or relaying um, and internal relaying. Um, if I say proxy it, it uh, doesn't go too well with certain people. Um, so let me explain a little bit. Um, Sandra, let me uh, pause there and, and yep. uh, bring in a question from Guillermo oh, yeah. uh, asking uh, in the in in the DDoS signaling test you were just mm -hmm. showing. Are you attacking Camellia or the Astra server behind? It's actually both because <laughs> because uh, of course Camellia could uh, could be affected, but in this case, at the rate that I gave it. It was only asterisk that was uh, not handling the the traffic. Um, Camellio was was able, as you could see, it was able to respond with a one hundred response uh, and so on and so forth. So Camellio was still working fine. <clears throat> Sorry, um, but asterisk, yeah, couldn't handle that. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Guillermo, for the question. So, um, yeah, let me go about this story. So, well, with TURN, um, TURN servers are kind of 
a part of the WebRTC infrastructure, right? In many cases, not always needed, but in, in many cases they are needed. It is kind of, you know, supposed to be the last resort mechanism for net traversal. And what it does for those who are not familiar is it allows parties to relay their traffic behind an AT, from being behind an AT. Um, so back in 2016 and 17, we were doing some, some of our first WebRTC penetration tests. And um, they included term server infrastructure. And I remember reading through the RFC, the, this was RFC 5766, and thinking like, seriously, is this <laughs> really how it works? Uh, in the RFC, to me at least, they, they described a mechanism that so sounded very much like a free to use SOX proxy or HTTP proxy, you know, these, these open HTTP proxies on the internet that people would abuse to uh, either tunnel into internal networks or uh, browse the internet semi-anonymously. Um, it sounded very similar to that. The only requirement with turn servers, unlike those, would normally be that authentication is required. Uh, so you couldn't just use a turn server like that. But the thing is that the credentials, they need to be dispensed to anyone using the WebRTC platform. So if you have a video conferencing system, you know, um, you need to give those credentials away. They might be temporary credentials. It doesn't matter, but the users get credentials. And on top of that, many of these WebRTC platforms have to be publicly available, right? Even if you have an internal system, you want to be able to invite, you know, external people uh, to call in. So those credentials are kind of public in, in, in many ways. So, yeah, um, the main problem for us, so this looks like a huge problem, huh? but uh, the main problem for us in ver verifying this vulnerability for our client uh, was that there were no publicly available tools to allow you to do that. Um, so, I kindly convinced my friend, Alfred, now he's my colleague, so uh, I convinced him to do more than just uh, develop a tool. Um, and he developed a tool that allowed us to demonstrate this before theoretical vulnerability. And that's now our tool set called Stunner. Uh, we call it Stunner, and that's how it was born. Um, and then, so with this, two, so we, we found out, okay, there really is a problem uh, for our clients. Um, it was one particular test that we were doing. Um, but having this developed this tool, right, uh, we started seeing results. And that was back in December, 2017. Our client fixed their, the issue on their end and we took some Christmas holidays we came back and in February 2018 decided, hey, let's test Slack. Um, let's see if this vulnerability exists there as well. And, you know, we've, we discovered that it was over there as well. Uh, they had a bug bounty and that's why we could actually test this. Um, without the, the bug bounty, we wouldn't have done any of that, of course. But uh, yeah, we took a while to submit our report because we were still kind of not sure about all the details. So we submitted our report in April. Um, and after a bit of back and forth, yeah, they pushed a fix. We verified the fix on their live servers. Um, and fast forward two years later in 2020, um, our report was made public. So uh yeah this is our report and yeah we of course included screenshots and videos eventually and you can you can if you if you want to be entertained you can enjoy the conversation and see how it all went and there was quite 
it's it's five years ago now, um, but it, there, and then three years ago when we asked to publish the report. Um, but eventually we, we could have published that and uh, talk about it at the conferencing, uh, say, uh, Voice over IP conferences. Um, and we published the blog post that, uh, you know, went quite well. Um, and as a result of this, what's important to know is that in our case, we could reach their internal uh, infrastructure where the turn server was, and we could reach the AWS metadata service, which meant that we had temporary access to temporary uh, secret access keys for AWS, which could in some cases be quite bad. It's not always bad depending on how you configure things, but uh, we could also reach other internal services. And the thing is, if you have, um, it, if you have an internal network quite often, um, you know, services don't require authentication or require weak credentials, you know. The security inside is much, much softer than it is on the outside quite often. So that's why it, this tends to be a problem. Um, it allows you to reach internal services. So yeah, we published that. Um, I suppose there were a lot of security people, security teams uh, scrambling to fix their, their own. Um, and then the story does not end there because um, you know it was still on our mind and we knew that this vulnerability had to be present elsewhere. So we decided to check out what other bug bounties there are, you know, that where we could, because we were seeing this on our clients' uh, applications, right? But we wanted to understand how widespread this is. Is it is just, just, you know, what our clients are using or is it more than that? And, and therefore, uh, yeah, we did, we spent some time and we found different vulnerabilities because we were looking at uh, WebRTC vulnerabilities as such. But out of the three different vulnerabilities, one of the major ones was this same uh, turn relay abuse vulnerability. And it affected, um, well, in this case, it affected uh, 8 by 8 There was some vendor, some vendor who had a bug bounty but did no one not want to be named so we will not name them um, and we could reach the AWS metadata service if they were on AWS quite often uh, we could reach other things like uh, I think they had a telnet server or something like that the co-turn uh, administrative interface um, yeah so it was quite interesting. Um, and then fast forward October 2020, we, um, we were preparing for, uh, that, I think, that summit. And while preparing for that and going to talk about this, uh, this vulnerability, and we discovered that uh, Cotern by then had had some protection mechanism in place for to prevent um, people from connecting to one two seven zero zero one to the local host IPs. Um, but while doing some tests, we realized that this could e be easily bypassed because you could instead of specifying one two seven zero zero one. In, in, on many Linux systems, you could specify 0000, and it would have the same effect. Slightly different, but it would have the same effect. We also realized that um, IPv6 might have similar issues. Uh, but the thing is, again, we didn't have tools that supported IPv6. Uh, uh, so we didn't have tools that supported relaying uh traffic over turn 
to an IPv6 address. So we added support to IPv6 on our tool set, Stunner. Um, and there were other bypasses there. Um, this could be reproduced on our demo server as well. And one can watch a short video demo here showing how to, um, how to bypass, how to reproduce this problem and bypass uh, uh, some simple protection on, on our Nginx web server. Um, and people can do it uh, by testing our demo server. Um, and yeah, and then uh, Cotern actually fixed it and they issued some advisories. And yeah, that was that was great. Um, it was uh, went really well there. And then last year, there was this blog post by uh, Christian Melmauer. Uh, he goes by the nickname of Firefart. Excuse my French. Um, and he released a blog post and advisories regarding um, Cisco Expressway. And one of the main issues that we have found was the term relay abuse in, in, this, in this particular product. And he also, uh, I'm mentioning this because he also released a tool called Stunner, which is similar to ours, does the same thing, but it's not this the same software. Uh, so it was se developed separately by by him on his own, and it's open source, unlike ours, which is great because we now recommend people to use his stunner uh, since ours is unfortunately not not open source. So that's 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 great. Um, and yeah, and that's that's the that's the story so far with the turn relay abuse. Uh, it's a very interesting feature uh, that can unfortunately in in the WebRTC uh, infrastructure that can unfortunately be abused for um, you know doing things that maybe uh, could lead to a security compromise. So yeah, that's this was this was our mind map so far. It's incomplete. We're still learning a lot about you know vulnerabilities that do affect WebRTC. But I hope it kind of gives you an idea of what sort of vulnerabilities you know can affect the the infrastructure when you're thinking about WebRTC. Because the thing is, you know, we're often the first thing you find when you look up WebRTC security. You find oh it's secure, therefore you know there's nothing to do. Well, yeah, it it does come with with a secure design, and and, and it's it's definitely much better. It's definitely much better than voice over IP, in in many cases. You know, um, there's encryption for the traffic. There's a certain enforcement, but there are still things that can go wrong. Uh, it doesn't come with a free, free uh, and secure. Uh, infrastructure so that's that's something that you know many companies need to uh think about thank you sandra yeah as uh there are definitely some built-in security aspects to webrtc but there's so much more to consider i mean you know you've been focused on the infrastructure security aspects we haven't even talked about it It'd be a whole different can of worms to talk about the the application security yeah. problems you could create in the way that you build your application, the way that you do your custom signaling, you mentioned yeah. that, uh, and as well as uh, privacy issues of how, you know, an application may decide to handle the video and audio streams and share those and whether their uh, users are being notified of that. So there's a lot to consider around application security and privacy for sure. Um, and really appreciate you sharing that mind map with us. Uh, if anyone else has questions, feel free to ask those on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitch, whatever platform you're watching this on. We'll make sure we get to those with Sandro in our closing minutes here. Uh, but before, let's, before yeah, go ahead, go, please. I should uh, plug our newsletter, actually. Please. Um, can, can you share the screen again? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I almost forgot. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's our website. And uh, rtcsec.com slash subscribe is how you get the newsletter and 
what we do in the newsletter is we go through the past month and we talk about RTC security. Um, and we look at the different news that came out that has some relationship to RTC security or presentations and so on and so forth. And you'd be surprised. I didn't. I didn't expect that there would be such a, a such an amount of uh, things that are relevant every month uh, with regards to voice over IP and WebRTC security. So yeah, please please do subscribe if this is you know the sort of topic you you're interested in. And we put a lot of effort in that. And it's not really you know it's not just an advert for us, but I think we we try to really. Uh, inform ourselves and inform our audience about what's happening yeah absolutely we definitely encourage our encourage our viewers to check that out at enablesecurity.com uh and the newsletter as well i can definitely recommend thanks uh, so sandro uh I, I thought the 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 turn the turn server discussion was really interesting because it helped show to me some of the the risk of you know if if you can access the, the turn server like that, being able to access other internal resources. And you mentioned things like AWS keys specifically. Uh, so that's that's really interesting. That's a good example of something that's very specific to WebRTC. How, you know, in, in what ways in general does testing security offensively for WebRTC differ from broader application security testing as well as VoIP? Okay, okay. So let me start by saying that there are a lot of similarities between testing custom applications and WebRTC platforms, okay? Now, we come a lot from a background of um, testing applic server-side applications and infrastructure sort of thing. So mm -hmm. that's, that's mostly our point of view, although we have done some other work as well there. But I think one difference is between general, you know, testing, security testing and, and WebRTC platforms um, is the lack of security tools uh, mm. that are available. There's not many, unfortunately. We're working on that, of course, by having, you know, SubVicious Pro. Um, it is still also not, you know, it's not feature complete or anything um, when it comes to WebRTC. Um, um, but we have certain features there, um, but there's not that many tools. We're on, on GitHub. We also have a repository, awesome RTC hacking tools or, or awesome RTC hacking, um, where we list the, these tools, uh, not just ours, but other people's open source and whatnot. Uh, but there's not many tools uh, that help you. So there's, there's that. And with that, also, there's not a lot of knowledge in the security community uh, on the various components of that that make up the WebRTC landscape. You could say. Mm -hmm. So we're also trying to work on that, but of course, you know, <laughs> there there needs to be more. Um, the our publications and our newsletter. Um, I hope that that works. But we're also still learning. I think it's kind of pretty new as technology so there's that and besides we're taught that it's secure so you know keep, <laughs> keep away <laughs> right exactly <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's sort of like however you know uh, we, we're also always taught about WebRTC that you can you can build all this with just a couple lines of javascript mm -hmm. and you know that's another example of things that we say about WebRTC that are maybe a little a little bit uh uh a little bit overly optimistic, let's say, mm, <laughs> yeah, just yeah. like WebRTC is secure. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, please make sure, by the way, to uh, share those links uh, with, with me after the broadcast, sure. and we'll be sure to include those in our blog post about this and, and uh, for Thank others you. to view as well. But but yeah, I mean, WebRTC, it's the pain and the pleasure of working in, in a space like this, that on the one hand, it's uh, there's a lot of creative work still to be done, mm -hmm. a lot of interesting applications yeah. to be built, security work to be done, but it is also, it's it's quite a small niche, isn't it? And so there's not as many tools, perhaps it for is. that reason. It is, and uh, yeah. It's it's. I mean, it's 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 great in a way, you know. It's it's a very right. interesting area. Um, also, the security solutions, kind of, that come with 
web RTC or in real time communications in general, even voice over IP, they they need to take into consideration that you know it needs to stay real time. So you know mm -hmm. they cannot create latency. So there's there's right. that as well, and security people don't really have experience with that. So in general, yeah. you know they add up things which create um, which make systems less efficient but more secure, maybe. And I think another thing to keep in mind is the impact of denial of service, mm -hmm. which in WebRTC and real-time communications in general, it's much more critical than in many, many other areas. You, with, with a web, web application, you know, you can handle things through load balancing and, and all of that, right? But with WebRTC, it's not that easy, right? That's that's it's not that easy. So, and there are many things that can go down: the, the media servers, the signaling servers, uh, you know, many things that can go wrong. So that that's 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 interesting in terms of normal testing and WebRTC. Yeah, absolutely. And latency is is so important in pretty much anything built with built with WebRTC. So yeah, don't balancing that. that against security. Yeah, don't touch the yep. latency. Yep. Yeah, yeah, incredibly important. Um, yeah, so you mentioned things like media servers too. Um, so the um, couple couple of questions around that. I mean, how do is is any what concerns do you have about uh, man in the middle attacks when you're, you know, WebRTC in its peer to peer mode shouldn't be vulnerable to that in theory. Um, but when you're using a media server, as many people do, uh, in order to scale the conversations, now you've introduced another, uh, another point in the attack surface, right? Yep, definitely. So look, it's not it's not as simple as we would like it to be, right? So there can be problems. Mm -hmm. When compared to voice over IP, it's definitely much better. But for example, one thing that we found with Slack in in the in another bug bounty report um, was that they were using back then they were using uh, Janus and mm -hmm. they were still using so uh, the developer of Janus, I think you had him on on your show, right? Yeah, yeah, Lorenzo. Yep, absolutely. Lorenzo. He at the very uh, initial commits, he had committed a sample uh, certificate and private key mm. uh, that came with the software, right? And you could, and they still had this from ages ago. Uh, I, <laughs> I saw the email address for the in the certificate information, and I thought. Oh, I know this this nickname, <laughs> <laughs> and I saw this in Wireshark captures. Okay, while uh -huh. monitoring my my traffic uh, between uh, my web browser and Slack's um, media servers, and so they were using a private key that is actually public. That is actually I could track it down in the Git repository. It was not present in the in the master, but if you Go back a little bit, you find it. Um, so that's one potential problem. We didn't manage to do man in the middle uh, with that because of the way Janus works, but it could be a, a, a big deal. Um, and with other platforms, it might be something similar, might be a huge problem if you have leaked uh, your private key, of course. That's mm -hmm. quite an obvious thing. Um, and of course, compromise of servers, right? Um, right. You're passing that that traffic or compromise of the signal, signaling servers as well can be a huge problem because you know that's where you have your um, your DTLS uh, hash being exchanged, mm -hmm. um, and so on and so forth. So there are there are places where this can be a problem. Uh, it's a I think it would warrant a very long discussion to explore. <laughs> um, and we we don't have you know extensive experience on that, although like I mentioned, we, we've seen some things. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a very interesting topic. Yeah. To summarize, 
yes it is encrypted but you know there's always caveats right <laughs> absolutely all right so um well uh fahad says he's subscribing to your newsletter so i'm sure we've got some additional people uh subscribing <laughs> and that's definitely one way to keep learning more about your work and uh jose asks uh hello sandro as a weber tc junior qa how could i start training myself to use tools like sipvicious oss to expand the quality of testing i do on a project um well, Subvicious OSS does not support anything related to WebRTC, so that's the, not going to You need the to pro be, version for that, correct? You need to the pro version for yeah. that. And um, what we do support is things related to the media, so mm -hmm. security tests related to the media, media and SIP over WebSocket. Right now, we don't support custom protocols, uh, and yeah, that's something that we we would like to work on in the future. Okay, sounds great. All right, Jose, talk to you boss about the pro version uh, for WebRTC. Um, and uh, all right, well, I think that brings us to the end of our time. Um, let me bring this back up one more time just to reiterate uh, how people can get in touch with you uh, and learn more about your work at Enable Security, Sandro. Uh, thanks again so much for joining us, Sandro. Really appreciate Thank you, Aaron. your time and sharing It's been your a pleasure. Oh, thank you. And as always, this video will be available on the WebRTC Ventures YouTube channel, as well as our blog at webrtc.ventures. And to find out more about our upcoming episodes, follow us on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and on YouTube. You can join our email list at WebRTC Ventures. Our next episode will be March 15th with Diana Pham from Vonage. So we hope that you'll join us for that. And to, to uh, conclude today's episode, uh, we are just going to share, once again, a short conversation I had with Alan Quayle about TADHack Open, which is an event coming up that we're proud to support at Weber TC Ventures. It's tied with the Enterprise Connect Conference and uh, just announced today as well. Our own COO at Weber TC Ventures, Mariana Lopez, will be working as a mentor at that event to uh, attendees remotely. And uh, so, yeah, great series of events. So check out this short conversation with Alan about TADHack. Thanks again, everyone for joining us today. Let's make it live. All right, I'm here with my friend, Alan Quayle from uh, TADHack. Uh, Alan, you and I have worked together a number of times over the years, know each, other, uh, each other's work well. I've been to a whole bunch of these TAD events. They're great events. Our team at Weber TC Ventures has participated in them a number of times and ways over the year. But for, for any of our viewers today who may not be familiar with TADHack, uh, tell us a little bit about it. Excellent. Uh, first of all, thank you, Aaron, for the invitation. Thank you for being a partner for TADHack Open. And let me give a little bit of information about what TADHack Open is all about. So it's on the 25th and 26th of March. That's the weekend before Enterprise Connect. Now, TADHack is a hackathon focused on programmable communication. So of course, uh, WebRTC Ventures and all the work they do is directly relevant. And we've been running for about 10 years now. Now, what do we mean by open in TADHack open? Well, since our founding in 2013, we've always stated TADHack is for everyone. And the diversity of people involved in TADHack has improved over that 10 years, but we can do more. So TADHack is working with groups committed to increasing the influence of women in building technologies that shape our future and change our world. So TATAC Open will help women, but not exclusively, demonstrate the vital contribution to programmable communications, not only in building skill, skills in important new technologies, but also in demonstrating their abilities to industry leaders at the largest enterprise communications event on Monday, the 27th of March at Enterprise Connect in Orlando. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of uh, an overview of what we've got coming up, Aaron. Wonderful, and I love the focus on uh, increasing the visibility of women in tech. That's great, uh, thank you for doing that. Who, so who can participate in these events? How do they sign up? What types of you know, roles do, uh, do, do the hack, hackathon teams need? Yep, absolutely. So uh, the website isn't live yet. It will be by the end of the month. Uh, so I just go to tadhack.com 
and it will be there. Just wait till February to uh, sign up. In terms of the skills you need, we, you know, I, I've already mentioned Tad Hack is for everyone. So you don't need to be a coder. Of course it helps. And that will be your focus in the team. But you could be from the strategy, marketing, uh, you know, any aspect of uh, a business. And you, you can join a team and help in terms of the presentation, in terms of the problem definition, because every team is judged on their pitch. That's five minutes. And it's all about the pitch. And the key is making the problem and the bit of the solution, your hack that you're uh, demonstrating, compelling. And having a diverse team really helps. So we've always said, you know, diversity is the key to success with uh, Tad Hack. All right. Thanks so much, Alan. So anyone who wants to participate, go to tadhack.com to learn more. I'll see you there myself, Alan. Thanks so Excellent. much. Thanks so much, Aaron. Thanks for joining us for WebRTC Live. Visit our website at webrtc.ventures to learn more about our custom design and development services and to learn more about upcoming episodes of WebRTC Live.